good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's Senate occasional lecture. And in welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay respects to all Indigenous elders, past and present. Well, if you've been following the media, you may know that Senate Estimates is in full swing this week. And as usual, we've had numerous revelations, some expected, some less than expected. And so we thought it would be a very good idea to have along somebody who's been an expert in, in governance for, for many, many years, and who I first met as a, a, an officer of the Department of Finance. And, uh, and that, of course, is Stephen Bartos. Stephen's an executive director of, of ASIL Allen Consulting, and uh, he advises on public policy, governance and risk. He's a, a widely published author, and uh, like me, you've probably read many of his pieces in the Canberra Times and particularly in The Public Informant. He was formerly a professor of governance and director of the National Institute of Governance at the University of Canberra and a deputy secretary of the Department of Finance. And I don't know if this is where we go or not, but um, of course now he's a friend. And uh, it's a very great pleasure to, to welcome him today to speak about uh, accountability and structures of, of government, and in particular, about the role of the Senate in public sector performance. So please join me in welcoming Stephen Bartos. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional Indigenous owners of the land where we are, pay my respects to their elders past and present, and pay respects to any Indigenous or Torres Strait Islander people who might be in the audience today. And can I assure you that I won't be getting into the day-to-day -day politics that are coming out in the estimates hearings. Those of you who uh, went to the uh, last, last time's venue for this lecture, the main committee room. Uh, we'll get your fill of that. I'm told the Senate Finance and Public Administration Committee is there. So if you want some exciting estimates hearings, you can go along to that instead. And if by any chance you're a senator who was meant to go to that hearing and you've strayed into here by mistake, stay, because <laughs> it might be fun for you. Because I'm really focusing on the role of the Senate in improving public sector performance. Gary Banks, who's Dean of the Australian and New Zealand School of Government, former head of the Productivity Commission, observed in the Garra narration in 2013 that Australians have been losing trust in their politicians and their public servants. And that was also covered in the last Senate occasional lecture by Professor Andrew Marcus, who looked at trust in the political system. Now, I'm not going to look at politicians. My work has been in public sector governance and concerned primarily with ways to improve the performance of the public sector. And that's why I want to address the pivotal role that the Senate can play in improving those services. But it's not to ignore trust. Performance and trust are inextricably related. One of the ways organisations build trust is to deliver the services that people want at the price that they want consistently and reliably. It's why, sadly, Organisations like McDonald's come up uh, very frequently in the lists of companies that people trust because of the reliability and consistency of what they deliver. In the public service, what that means is delivering good advice to ministers, means delivering quality services to the public, means delivering effective and well-administered regulation. Let's take it as a given that public services are important and we want them to be better. They are, they're hugely important to Australia. If we look at the 2014-15 budget papers, we see that payments made by the Australian government are 25.3% of the gross domestic product of Australia. That is, they're around a quarter of all of the goods and services that we produce. And despite what you might hear in the media about budget cuts, over the whole of the forward estimates period, there's a decline that's very small indeed, to 24.8%, so only 0.5 of a percent. In other words, for the foreseeable future, around a quarter of all activity in this country is down to the federal government. 
The payments it makes go to things like social security, health, education and defence. And by mentioning those four, I've already covered two thirds of the entire budget. But there's numerous other functions that government delivers. And it's in all of our interests that those are done well. Now we do elect governments to make sure those are done well. And politicians, political parties compete for our votes on the basis of promises and we decide who we think will make the best choices about their spending, taxing and regulation. But all of the literature on governance, the field that I work primarily in, tells us that you can't rely on managers alone to deliver good results. A system of accountability that holds managers to account for performance is vital. <coughs> So that, that applies absolutely in relation to the private sector. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of literature on uh, corporate governance worldwide and in the uh, published copy of this speech, which you'll be able to find online after this presentation, I've got some references to that. Uh, in Australia, the Australian Stock Exchange's Corporate Governance Council suggests that board has to be responsible for overseeing management's implementation of the entity's strategic objectives and its performance. So in the private sector, a good board will devote much of its time to quizzing the CEO and management on how they're performing. And good CEOs and managers welcome that. By being put through the ringer, by being given a really tough time, they are aided to deliver the best results possible. A tough board that asks really difficult questions helps the company succeed. And in the commercial sector, obviously, that's a, that's a priority. It, it helps you avoid bankruptcy. It helps you avoid financial ruin. Public sector doesn't face that kind of commercial pressure and incentive. It's, by definition, not part of the for-profit sector. Public sector bodies have a wide variety of different objectives. Achievement of those can be difficult to measure. And a self-interested minister or public servant allowed a free choice between meaningless waffle versus genuine performance information to hold them to account, it's more likely to choose the waffle over the, the uh, meaningful performance information. And that's a well-recognised problem. Uh, it's, it's a well-recognised problem in all of the literature on public sectors. Um, and they're overcome as a problem through effective institutional arrangements for accountability. And in Australia, chief amongst those is the role of the Senate. The Senate can be highly effective in ensuring the public service is held accountable for performance, but its ability to do so is limited by the support and information it receives. And in respect of those limitations, there's room for improvement, and that's what I want to concentrate on in this lecture. In the book I wrote on uh, public sector governance in Australia, I characterised accountability not as a set of rules, but as a relationship. There has to be a personal body who's held accountable and a personal body to which they account. In the Australian public sector, our accountability from the public service goes through ministers who are then accountable to the parliament, but there is a duty that's recognised in legislation and in policy for public servants to justify their actions directly to the parliament. And in this week in particular, as the legislation committees conduct estimate series hearings, that accountability relationship comes to the fore. The Senate's capacity to exercise its role in the relationship has had ups and downs over the past 115 years. And it depends not just on who the senators are, the composition of the Senate, but the structures and advice which support it, and also the political environment. And I think there's two factors in play right at the moment which have the potential to weaken Senate scrutiny. They're one, the blurring of the dividing lines between what public servants are responsible for and what ministers are responsible for, and two, the quality of the performance information itself that's provided to the Senate. So let's deal with those one at a time. First, our system of government has traditionally recognised a difference between the roles of public servants and ministers. It, that's in contrast to the United States where the executive branch of government comprises the president, the president's staff, the whole of the cabinet, and also the senior levels of the public service. Australia inherited a different tradition from the United Kingdom, uh, which has had an independent merit-based public service uh, since the late 1800s. And in the speech, I give you a reference to the 
19, uh, sorry, not, not 19, 1854 Northcote Trevelyan Report, which is often credited with introducing that uh, modern system of uh, Westminster style public services. Uh, though, if you look at the history of how Britain implemented it, it took them uh, more than 40 years to uh, get through the Northcote Trevelyan Report and, and implement it fully. So, we, we inherited when we started uh, a system where the public service was seen as different. And although Australians have never had a high regard for politicians, and you only need to go back to folk songs even pre-Federation uh, to understand the way in which uh, Australians regard their politicians, uh, public servants were traditionally seen as different. They attracted a higher level of respect. However, in recent years, the distinction between the public service and ministers has diminished and as a result, in the polling, uh, public servants and ministers uh, are starting to trend towards the same levels of esteem. Now, in relation to that, uh, the Senate uh, has to have a role in holding public servants to account. And I think it's important to reflect back on what Senate estimates hearings are. They've always had an element of political theatre. They've always had an element of parochial self-interest. It used to be the case a long time ago that the Senate had what were then called estimates committees. Now it's the estimates hearings of the legislation committees. Uh, and finance, the department I was working for at the time, provided advisers who actually went and sat with the committees, the estimates committees of the Senate, to assist them in understanding budget estimates. And in 1987, I was appointed to head the communications section in the finance department that dealt with the communications portfolio. I knew all of the details of expenditure in that portfolio back to front and brought along a briefcase full of materials. And I had a really good lesson in political realities from doing that. I'd prepared really diligently and none of the senators wanted any of the material I'd prepared. My main recollection of that hearing was it was concentrating very firmly uh, on, a, on a quizzing of the ABC about the number and the timing of the broadcasts of horse races in Tasmania. <laughs> and, and the senator concerned, I think, thought that the horses in his state were not getting a fair go from the ABC. And, and, and indeed, Tasmanian senators are famous for pursuing the interests of their state. So look, although I'm about to discuss problems with accountability systems and how the Senate uh, can actually hold the public service more accountable for performance. I don't want you to think, think that I'm, I'm being nostalgic and looking back to a day when politics never came into it. It always has, always will, because the Senate reflects, as it should, a wide variety of interests. But look, some things have changed since 1987 when I first got involved in that way. Interestingly, up until the public sector reforms of the 1980s, uh, the public service asserted to itself a right to do things independently of government. Ironically, this gave public servants themselves a high degree of political freedom. Uh, finance, uh, for a couple of years, prided itself on employing both the ACT president of the Liberals and the ACT president of the Labor Party because it proved they were even-handed. And, and I should here disclose that Way back at that time, I was active in the Labor Party. I, I did allow my membership to lapse after I was appointed to the Senior Executive Service in 1989 because I took the view that it was difficult uh, to uh, participate in politics when you're at a senior level in the public service. I also should say that having worked at a senior level for the Hawke, the Keating and the Howard governments, I saw successes and I saw failings in all of those governments. So uh, today I'm pretty much agnostic. I'm not affiliated with any of the major parties or, or lean towards them. Uh, but I think it's worth emphasising that despite what you might see from some of the political commentary, all of the ministers, or at least the finance ministers who I worked with, uh, were actually very sincerely committed to making well-informed decisions in the best interests of the country. And, and I'm still proud of having uh, advised John Fay as finance minister uh, that helped him uh, to the best ever track record, as measured in budget terms, in uh, managing government expenditure so as to achieve government finances. But during that period of the 70s and 80s, it was quite possible 
for public servants to express views that were independent or at variance from those of the government. It was not uncommon, on, uncommon to see articles from Treasury economists or from health policy experts or from social policy experts in journals that were contributing factual information to public policy. It, it, it wasn't considered uh, a good thing to have partisan comment and, and that wasn't, wasn't the point. But it was still quite okay to put factual information into the public debate even if that factual information might contradict something a minister might say. That's been overtaken by a new approach where it appears de facto that public servants say very little and when they do say anything, it's to explain government policies. And in fact, that's the guidance that they get from the Australian Public Service Commission. In a similar vein, it used to be that Senate and other parliamentary inquiries into questions of public administration would hear from a range of departments and agencies about their views. I remember that was the case, for example, when we were introducing changes to uh, the Audit Act 1901 that became the new Financial Management and Accountability Act. It wasn't my area at the time, but uh, uh, the people uh, concerned with it uh, had various uh, hearings where different departments expressed their own views and they weren't always uh, very uh, favourable towards finance about the proposed changes that were coming in place. Today, we see only one government view expressed, and we saw that with recent Senate inquiry into new regulations under the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act, where the only dissenting views that were expressed to that inquiry came from the Public Service Commission and the Auditor General, that is, bodies that had a statutory independence. Otherwise, it was just one government view. Um, and that's despite what I know are significant misgivings that many people in departments and agencies have about the rate of progress and some of the detail of those regulations. Now, that is not necessarily a bad thing. We have seen a greater identification of public servants and ministers, but that is, is in some ways a plus. It's the trade-off that we've made in terms of going to a system of greater responsiveness. The days of public service mandarins who ruled vast empires of bureaucrats and thought ministers were just a temporary inconvenience are gone and very few people would welcome their return. Greater responsiveness is a good thing. It's surely better for government policies to be determined by the elected politicians than by unelected public servants. But there is a trade-off. Responsiveness inevitably means public servants and their work are closely identified with the priorities of the government of the day. They, they're not pursuing any separate identified uh, role. And that creates a difficulty in practical terms for the workload of Senate committees. Because public servants are closely identified with ministers and government policy, it's really hard for a government senator to quiz a public servant about performance. If by doing so you either deliberately or even worse, accidentally reveal a problem, then that reflects back on the minister who's responsible for those public servants. Less of a problem, and we, we're seeing that with the estimates hearings going on this week and next, less of a problem soon after a change of government. This is, you can always say, uh, we've, we found a problem, but it's not the current minister, it was the other guys. Uh, but uh, the longer a government remains in office, the less likely it is that any, that, uh, sorry, the more likely it is that if a senator raises problems, they'll be sheeted home to the, uh, a government decision, which means that in practice, only half a committee feels free to ask searching questions. So that diminishes its capacity to improve performance. I think there's some answers, but we'll get on to answers after the second part of the diagnosis, and that is incomplete, sometimes incomprehensible performance information. We have an accountability system that relies on the provision by the public service of clear and reliable performance information to the Senate. Now, 10 years ago, when I was teaching at the ANU to an executive cohort from the public service, I distributed for amusement a fictional confidential briefing on how to escape accountability. I've attached it as an appendix to this lecture and it contains uh, six pieces of good advice, which uh, include make sure your performance reporting structure changes each year, that makes it impossible for you to be held to account. If possible, change the descriptions every year. If you can change the actual objective without anyone noticing, make sure it's changed to one easier to achieve and keep it vague. If you can't change the outputs and outcomes structure, at least use different performance criteria each year. If you've been forced by difficult senators into providing 
performance measures that are consistent, ensure they're impossible to measure in any one year, make sure they cover a decade. <laughs> Never be re fully responsible for something, only contribute, it, contribute to it. That way, if it's a success, you can say we did it, and if it's a failure, you, you can say we only contributed a little bit. Uh, make sure that you reallocate responsibility for who delivers the, the outcomes to a different part of your organisation every year. That way no one can actually be held accountable for it. And if all else fails, change the managers entirely. New management has two years in which they can blame the past administration and by the third year there's an election anyway. Now, I thought this was just for amusement and, and, and everyone here has, has had a laugh. The sad thing was that the course participants said, that's not fiction. That's a description of the way we operate. <laughs> and look, if you look at the literature on accountability, from an academic perspective, not much has changed. And I refer here to the excellent work that uh, Richard Mulgan has done. He's written extensively and perceptively on the topic. But the, the sad thing is that uh, if you change a couple of the case studies and a few of the names, some of what Richard uh, wrote 10 years ago could apply equally well today. The former Management Advisory Board, which was the key advisory body on, on public administration, uh, issued a report on accountability in June 1993, uh, which remains a foundation document on this topic. It's still referenced by the Public Service Commission in its guidance to public servants that it provides online about how to remain accountable. And it calls for management information systems that deliver good program performance information. But that was 20 years ago and we are still struggling to account to for performance. So last year, the ANAO, the Australian National Audit Office, issued a report called the Australian Government Measurement and Reporting Frameworks Pilot Project to Audit Key Performance Indicators, which looked at 31 KPIs, found that five didn't actually measure anything, uh, or at least they, they didn't meet the definition of measuring impacts and were descriptions of activity instead, of the remainder, only one of them met the criteria that they'd set of being focused, understandable, measurable and free from bias. Now that's an important stream of work for the Audit Office and it's been carried on, it's been continued and, and this is a, a really good thing. But as noted in its report on that work in February 2014, uh, let me quote, the continuation of the pilot project observed little change within the guidance promulgated by finance and observed that agencies' implementation of performance measurement and reporting requires further development. In other words, progress has been very slow. Now, I think it would be wrong to conclude from this that you cannot measure public sector performance because experience shows that where agencies put their minds to it, as they have been forced to from time to time, they can and they do develop clear and measurable objectives and effective performance indicators. There are other explanations for why we've taken one step forward and two steps back. Let's look at some of those since that period uh, of the last 20 years. The 1996 National Commission of Audit was actually really strong on performance information. It said that it was critical in assessing whether policy goals have been achieved and how effectively the public sector has performed Unfortunately, one of its recommendations for better performance reporting was that ministers should report against annual plans that explain strategies for restructuring and reducing costs. Most of the focus of that 96 Commission of Audit was reducing costs, and that focus was seen as too extreme. Not much of it became official policy. However, one of the things that did happen was that in the 96 and 97 Commonwealth budgets, there was a heavy emphasis on privatisation contracting out. And as a result of that, some of the reporting mechanisms, such as mandatory evaluation that the government used to have, were dropped. Now, it's based on a fair enough logic, even if it's been overtaken by events, that if you can put everything out to the market, the market will decide whether it's performing well or not, so you don't need to evaluate. While I say that's internally consistent logic, it also is irrelevant logic for those activities that you, you decide you do not want to put out to the market and it pretty quickly turned out that the government didn't have an appetite for marketisation of everything. Another factor was the reforms that I was responsible for in 1999-2000 to put the budget onto an outcomes, outputs and accruals basis. It stood the test of time with some modifications. It remains the Commonwealth's budget system, but in respect of re performance reporting, results were mixed. Bringing the budget onto an accruals basis was a good thing in that it allowed the budget and the annual reports to be considered 
on the same basis. Annual reports had already been done on an accruals basis. Uh, we saw for the first time an estimate of Commonwealth net worth. That's a really important measure of the government's stewardship of its own resources. We got balance sheet information, we got a much improved statement of risks, all sorts of good things. But at the same time, other information was lost. Sometimes it was just for practical reasons. One of the things that I really miss in the budget papers is what used to be provided, and that is a nice graph showing the trends in each function over time. That no longer appears. It wasn't produced in 99, 2000 because there was a break in the series. The past cash information couldn't be graphed on the same lines as, as the contemporary uh, accrual information. But we've now had 15 years and that could be reintroduced should government decide to do it. But the other thing that happened, unfortunately, was that we devolved responsibility to departments to decide on their own performance measures. And although some of them did that really well, others took the opportunity to reduce the amount of performance information they provided. And I suppose that reveals the limits to devolution. In retrospect, it would have been better to have had greater central direction to preserve integrity of performance reporting. But after all of that, we then came to the almost a decade of the mining boom of the 2000s when government revenues grew every single year, government finances were under no pressure and the public service grew massively. So the financial imperative to justify every dollar spent no longer applied and in those sleepy years standards of performance reporting slipped. So we, what we have seen is a reduction in uh, some of the performance information that's provided. And that's caused problems. Caused problems in political trust. It's caused problems for the past government. Well, look, I don't wish to uh, prejudge any results that might come out of current Royal Commission processes, but it does seem to me likely that if the Rudd government had had a better appreciation of performance indicators, or to put it another way, what works and what doesn't in delivering government programs, it might have had a better go at designing some of its financial stimulus programs, such as house insulation and, and saved a deal of criticism. With the current government, some, again, far from everything, I, they're, 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 I'm, I'm not going to put uh, all of the problems that government's facing down to lack of performance information, but some at least of the government's present troubles in explaining the most recent May budget arise from the lack of decent baseline performance information, decent data on trends because if those were more widely available they would illustrate that we do have a real budget problem of sustainability and that would be apparent to a wider audience than the very strange people like economists who enjoy reading through tables and numbers in the budget. Uh, I, I, I did that this, this budget and I admit it's a, it's a minority pursuit, it's probably illegal in some countries but uh, uh, it's, it's something that uh, uh, you have to be able to do, but presenting that information in a better way so that your, your average reader can understand it, I think, uh, would be uh, highly beneficial. So what it, what it illustrates is that, while clearly holding public service to account is really good in terms of the role of the Senate, it's also a positive for government. So the question I want to ask is, can we help the Senate to ask tougher, better questions about performance? Some of that lies within the government's own control. Uh, its National Commission of Audit recommendation, nine of its second report, suggested that there should be much better performance information. And the government hasn't rejected that. It's on the list of things to do after the budget. Similarly, it recommended reinstating mandatory evaluation. That was recommendation 10 of the second report. I do have I suppose one problem with that recommendation because uh, the weakness that I see with it is it suggests that final evaluation reports be provided to the Department of Finance on completion. You can't help but think that the Department of Finance, which provided more than half the Secretariat, might have written that one uh, because that approach means that the evaluation could conceivably remain buried. A much better option, to my mind, would be for the evaluation reports to be published on completion, which would enable not just the Senate, but any members of the public to be much better informed. And remember that it's public money that's being used for the evaluation itself, 
as well as public money and the expenditure of public money that's being examined by the evaluation. So, so it makes sense to me for it, it to become public. Um, but with that proviso about that recommendation, it seems to me there's no earthly reason why the government shouldn't respond anything but favourably to those National Commission of Audit recommendations about greater transparency. I also think there could be better support to the Parliament itself in understanding the estimates in the budget. I did a report to the Business Council of Australia on budget integrity, which was published as an attachment to their 2011-12 budget submission. In it, I noted that you could task a parliamentary budget office, not just with costing proposals, but with fiscal sustainability reporting. Are our government finances sustain sustainable over the longer term? You could get it to do evaluation of major areas of spending that are difficult for government to address internally, possibly because they cross too many boundaries, uh, possibly because of other uh, difficulties. It could look at tax expenditures, that is all of the tax concessions that are incorporated in the budget. And also, very importantly, I suggested it should play a role in explaining and commenting on the budget, which is far more of a black box than it should be. And look, in the end, the, the PBO has largely been confined to the costings role. I don't know, and if there's any senators or staffers in the room, they might tell me if it does work behind closed doors on budget analysis briefing individual senators, but there's no apparent public release of education and explanation materials. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, in many respects, the PBO is, is of more benefit to the executive branch than the legislative branch of government because it takes workload off of finance and treasury in doing costings. But the PPO, it's a creation, the parliament. It would be well within uh, the scope of, of the parliament to ask the PBO to deliver independent advice on performance measures and how well agencies are delivering against them. Look, a, a, another step forward that could be useful is more information in the budget papers themselves and that uh, may well arise from implementation of something called the Public Government's Performance and Accountability Act. But the other thing that I want to mention is that even though this week reminds us about the importance of the budget, it's not in some, some ways the most important time for addressing performance because the budget itself addresses only a tiny fraction of revenue and expenditure. So if we look at the budget papers, we see that between uh, the election and the mid-year economic and, and fiscal outlook, Policy decisions had a $2 billion impact on the budget bottom line. The May budget had a further $1.9 billion impact. That's against total Commonwealth expenditures of $415 billion. I'll save you doing the maths in your head. Policy decisions, all the stuff that's generated so much heat, amounts to less than 1% of total budget expend uh, expenses. In any one year, budget decisions, they're not just the tip of the iceberg, they're the seagull sitting on the top of the tip of the iceberg of budget expenditure. Admittedly, the budget can announce changes in year one that have much bigger effects in later years, but even so, in the case of the most recent budget, all of the changes to indexation and so on uh, make at most a 10% uh, difference to the budget over the long term. The vast bulk of budget spending churns on regardless. And I think the Senate also has a key role in examining the underside of the iceberg when it has its hearings on additional estimates where it has the benefit of agency annual reports. Now that's in some ways a dubious benefit, not all annual reports are good, but they are getting better. Publication of evaluations will help, that's also a plus, but a further recommendation in the Commission of Audit will also help. It recommended that the Department of Finance conduct rolling strategic reviews of major spending programs. That is, look at the stuff that doesn't appear in the tip of the budget iceberg. That's, a, that's an excellent idea. Though, again, as with the evaluation one, it has the defect of recommending that that be done internally inside budget with recommendations to be brought forward to the Minister for Finance. Having said that, if the government agrees to that, then uh, it will be an option for the Senate Finance and Public Administration Committee to ask the Department of Finance what it's reviewed and then it can send people off uh, in the other legislation committees covering the, the relevant programs to, to do a little more digging. I'm reasonably confident that the government is likely to accept that one as well. Uh, 
Unfortunately, after I'd done this lecture, uh, Matthias Cormann, I see in the newspapers this morning, has announced that there will be a further statement later this year on governance in the public sector. Uh, but uh, I, I could hope that uh, that statement on governance will pick up some of these recommendations. Having said all of that, that brings us back to the elephant in the Senate committee room, and that is, how can you do all of that in a way that genuinely addresses performance rather than it turning into a political circus? I deliberately use that metaphor with the elephant and the circus, so you can imagine the Senate committee room with a great big ball and an elephant on, on top of it. And it seems to me that there is a possible answer. Something that the Australian government lacks, but does work in other jurisdictions, is a very clear statement from government as to the matters of public administration for which government is responsible and the matters for which the public service is responsible. And making, making reference to uh, the distinctions that are made in the guidelines for official witnesses about the distinction between policy and administration is no substitute for a formal statement both on the part of the government on the one hand and the public service on the other. And we needn't look no further than New Zealand. It was a leader in codifying statements of expectations and intent which have been used with, with some success in uh, Australian government agencies, but, but only in some and uh, uh, not necessarily as, as rigorously as New Zealand, but, but they've moved on from there. New Zealand, while retaining some of that approach, uh, has identified key result areas which clearly allocate responsibilities and accountability. So Prime Minister John Key has set out 10 priority results and targets to be achieved and the public service reports separately on its progress against doing that, both as a whole through the State Services Commission in New Zealand and through individual departmental reports. And from the outside, uh, that approach seems to be working, it seems to have helped that country in addressing its budget problems. Uh, and uh, sad as it might seem to admit that New Zealand is doing something better than us, uh, uh, this is uh, something that we could uh, potentially learn from. There may be practical barriers. Look, some ministers actually prefer not to have clear statements of roles because it gives them greater freedom with, with which to operate. There are some activities of government where there's a genuine overlap uh, between the role of ministers and public service. Things like the conduct of economic policy or the design of regulation or, or things like that. Uh, but they're only a small fraction, a tiny percentage of public service activity. Most of the work of the public service is in administration of programs or administration of regulation. So if we try and get it perfect for the entire public service, we will fail. But it is possible to get, I think, through a rough and ready approach, with some exceptions, much greater certainty about who is responsible for what. You could conceivably have a cascade downwards of uh, a statement from the Public Service Commissioner, um, supplemented by additional information from each agency, or if the Commission of Audit recommendation, which is still to be addressed about the future of the Public Service Commissioner, uh, overtakes that, whoever uh, exercises that role. And look, amongst the beneficiaries would be ministers themselves who already struggle uh, to cope with the workloads that they have and have been struggling with that for a long time. And let me outline what the end result might be. It could be a committee hearing about the estimates where a senator from either the government side or the opposition side or an independent senator questions the public servants about matters that are very clearly the responsibility of the public service, nothing to do with the minister. And problems are identified. It would be wonderful if we could get a ministerial response along the following lines. Thank you, Senator, for helping identify my department's difficulties in administering this program. It's great news, we can deal with the problems. It'll help improve public service for all Australians. That would be, that would be an ideal. A minister could say, uh, as, a, as a consequence of that, I'm terribly shocked and heads will roll, or something even better, would be if they said, heads won't roll. We need those heads because they contain public servants' knowledge about how to avoid those same mistakes in future. They've learnt valuable lessons. Well, look, I don't want us to get too carried away or too optimistic. Senate hearings will inevitably contain politics because remember, first and foremost, senators are politicians. But I do think that a a much clearer and a publicly available statement of what public servants are really responsible for 
coupled with performance information that holds them to account for that, will at the very least be an improvement on what we have today. And so on that note, I'm going to go over and join the clerk and take any questions that we might have. Thanks. Well, thank you, Stephen. That was a very interesting and somewhat provocative uh, account of uh, the state of affairs in between the public service and Senate committees at the moment. If you do have a question, uh, I'd invite you to go to one of the microphones on either side of the aisle. And may I invite our first questioner to fire away, please. Oh, thank you. Um, just harking back to your comments about the budget and having difficulty reading what the situation is, both sides of politics commit to running a budget surplus over the economic cycle. I was wondering if you could explain to me what that actually means. And in doing so, could you refer to structural budget figures? Because they were in the budget papers for a short period of time. They seem to have disappeared for the last few years. Um, and I was wondering if the Commission audit looked at structural budget figures at all in their recommendations. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's uh, a number of different questions, but uh, let's get first to that issue of running a surplus over the course of the economic cycle. Traditional notions of uh, the economy are that uh, we go through periods of uh, growth and then decline. Uh, interestingly, in Australia, we've gone through a period now of, of 23 years of nothing but growth. But uh, even so, uh, some periods the growth has been stronger than others. And the idea of maintaining the budget in balance over the course of the cycle is that uh, when times are good, you save some money, and when times are bad, uh, you can uh, then have the ability to spend some more money. So, so maintaining the budget uh, in uh, either in balance, that is on an even keel, or, or in, a, in a slight surplus over the course of the cycle, enables you to, uh, in effect, uh, deal with any economic downturns that might come much more effectively. Um, now, uh, there's, there are real difficulties in measuring that. So economists who look at uh, uh, what is the structural state of the budget have to take account of uh, what might have happened without government spending, uh, what's happening in the rest of the world. And, and uh, working, working that out is, is in fact uh, an incredibly complex thing to do. Uh, and in Australia, it's, it's made, been made a little more difficult by the fact that uh, with that really long period of economic growth, um, what, what really is the structural state of the budget. To illustrate that difficulty, uh, Treasury, at the time of the global financial crisis, argued that we needed a lot of government spending in order for us not to dip into uh, a recession. In effect, what they did was use government spending to build a little bridge over the chasm. And, and that was uh, uh, seen as, as a desirable thing in the Treasury documents at the time. Uh, it was, it's also since been criticised uh, by what was then the opposition, now the government, for having done too much of it. Uh, so, so, so working it out exactly is incredibly difficult. I suspect that's why uh, we don't have as much information about the structural state of the budget uh, in the budget papers themselves. Uh, but I would encourage, uh, if anyone here is from Treasury, uh, some of that material that Treasury works on about trying to calculate that uh, to be released into the public domain, perhaps through the Treasury website. PBO has done a paper on it as well. Yes, you're quite right. And that, that is publicly available. Uh, look, I, I think the, the other thing to, to mention is that uh, uh, the budget uh, at the moment isn't in a state of uh, uh, real difficulty uh, uh, short term. Uh, the thing that is worrying policymakers is the longer term effects of trends in particularly health spending uh, and trends in uh, social welfare expenditure as the population ages. Question on my left. Thank you. My question relates to the role of the Senate in relation to accountability for delivery of services. Government is responsible for delivery of a wide range of services. Many services that used to be delivered directly by the public sector are now contracted out to the private sector. And of course, a wide range of issues arise in relation to the way those services are delivered by the private sector. What should be the role of the Senate in pursuing accountability for delivery of services where they're delivered 
by the private sector? Should it be confined to questioning officials on their management of the contracts? Should the Senate go further and seek to call private sector contractors uh, who are delivering services under contract? Hmm. That's a very tricky question because, uh, look, uh, in terms of uh, in an in-principle answer, you would think that they ought to be able to uh, call the private sector contractors. But in practice, I don't think that they would uh, be able to go there. It would just be practically too difficult and uh, it's not something institutionally that's built into the thinking of, of the providers. It might be uh, extremely difficult to get people willing to provide those services uh, if they uh, were subject to, to that kind of uh, process. Uh, but even more importantly, I don't think it would be feasible uh, to, in effect, retrospectively apply that. So, in other words, people who've currently got a government contract for delivery of service were suddenly told, uh, you didn't know this at the time you bid for it, but we're now going to make you appear before Senate com committees, uh, I think I think wouldn't be uh, something you could do. You could introduce it prospectively for the future. Uh, but one of, the, one of the ways around it, and I think that this is uh, something that can be done, is to actually hold the public servants uh, to account for the performance of those contractors and all of those contracts do have performance information embedded in them that is reported to the public servants and to ask the public servants how are your contractors performing against that performance information uh, and, and getting them to uh, talk that through uh, I think is, is uh, your other option. Um, but don't get me started on how much of that might be classified as on water or commercial inconfidence or, or some other way of avoiding scrutiny. Uh, that, that's an increasing problem uh, as well. Uh, and, and that, uh, I think, I think is, is an unresolved question where uh, I, uh, to be honest, uh, think that the Senate does have a role in, in asserting um, the, the, the commercial inconfidence, for example, um, uh, excuse. Uh, for not talking about the performance of your contractors uh, tends to fall apart in reality because most of the contractors have agreed that that can be made available. So um, uh, it's, it's not really commercial and confidence, that's just a smokescreen. So, so I, think, I think there is a, a, a proper and important role for the Senate in quizzing about that. But you've been, you've been observing these things for a long time yourself, haven't you? So, so what's your view? Well, I think there is a gap in public accountability in the whole of the administrative law area and in this area. And my own view is that public sec contracts for performance of public services should include provisions to ensure proper accountability. Mm. May I add something? <laughs> um, on a technical uh, um, basis, the estimates process itself is limited under the standing orders to senators asking questions of ministers and officers about the items of expenditure. But that's only the estimates process. In every other mode of operation, Senate committees have the power and the ability to call basically anyone before them. So if there was a, an inquiry into delivery of a particular service, there is no inhibition on the power of the Senate and its committees to call private contractors as well as government officers. Now, the reality, as we've mentioned, is that that um, commercial inconfidence blanket that people hide under can be, a, um, can be a deterrent to the provision of information to the Senate for our benefit. Um, but, but there are some rules in the Senate about uh, a requirement that if you're going to make a commercial inconfidence claim, you need to provide a, a, an explanation of the actual harm to the public interest that will, or, and in, in th that case, what commercial harm will result from the um, disclosure of the information. And in fact, the Auditor General has been working for many years on uh, government contracts contracts for provision of services um, to ensure 
at the behest of the Senate that they don't contain unnecessary confidentiality provisions that would prevent the provision of information to Parliament. So I think there, there are some solutions there. But it's not my lecture, and I'm sorry. <laughs> but that, 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 that was a very good correct, because also, we, you, you're quite right, we, we tend to get, uh, because of it's, it's been the news of the week, we, we're uh, looking uh, in our minds uh, a lot at the estimates committees, but uh, the estimates hearings, but the legislation committees have inquiries uh, uh, that are wide ranging on all sorts of other things, and uh, uh, that's that's a very important mechanism of the Senate. Now we'll go over to, back to the other side. Hi, um, I just had a question in light of Senate estimates. As you'd be aware, that um, a very common response that public servants do give is. That is a minister. Uh, sorry, that is a matter for the government, um, in order to uh, avoid providing further information on that topic. Do you have any comments about whether, in your experience, you've seen um, that increasing in recent years? Um, how, and also, any suggestions you might have for um, when when that sort of response is given? How senators or what the role of the Senate should be in prosecuting that matter? That matter further rather than just dropping it? Yeah, sure. Uh, look, partly that was why I was advocating uh, something that gave more clarity around that. Uh, I did mention the guidelines to official witnesses, and they do provide that public servants don't comment on matters of policy, they, they comment on matters of administration, and there's, there's quite extensive guidance in those uh, uh, guidelines for witnesses, and, and they change from time to time, but uh, that particular a uh, set of provisions has been around for as long as I can remember. 89. Uh, 89, mm -hmm. thank you. There you go. Still waiting revision. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, I think, uh, an area where uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty well established part of uh, uh, the way things work. Uh, does it happen more often now? Um, look, can I... This isn't Chatham House rule, it's being recorded, but I, I'll, I'll, I'll venture, I'll, I'll venture uh, an opinion anyway, and that is that I think what I am seeing is um, a greater reluctance on the part of public servants to provide any information, not just because it might be policy related, but for the other reason that we were just talking about of commercial and confidence, or for, for various other reasons. And uh, that's not because they've become just inherently more secretive, but because a lot of the incentives on them, as I was trying to explain in the lecture uh, today, are to uh, actually try and protect ministers and, and protect their positions and so on. And, and so I, th I think the incentives have changed a bit, so, so we probably are seeing more of that uh, behaviour of trying to uh, avoid questions Might I add something on, on that as well? And um, any of these claims by ministers or witnesses, public officials, that they can't answer that question because it's a matter for the minister, that, that's not a conclusive answer for a Senate committee. And a Senate committee may, if it chooses to, press the, um, press the witness and uh, insist on an answer. And it can also put the, uh, uh, the alternative view that, uh, listen, it's not for you to tell us what information we, can, we are allowed to have, the elected representatives of the people here. It is for us to determine whether we accept the ground you are putting forward for not answering that question. And that's, that's certainly becoming more, more um, accepted as, as a method of... of um, going about these things. I could go into lots of details, but again, it's not my lecture and yeah, there's another question. But I, I will say it's certainly the case that uh, the Senate has always had, uh, uh, amongst the ranks of senators, uh, people with a really strong commitment to openness, accountability and transparency. And uh, in, in, the, in the formal lecture, I mentioned people like uh, Senator Andrew Murray or Senator Alan Misson. I, I think Alan Misson would be horrified at some of the uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, secrecy that, uh, and and also uh, some of the uh, assaults on on personal freedoms at, at the moment. Another question, Beth. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks. Um, we've focused very much in this in, in your talk. Thank you, and in the discussion about um, accountability around public administration. Um, but that still leaves us a long ways, a long way away from any accountability for real outcomes. 
Uh, and um, in the news this week, we see that Australia is, is now um, almost equivalent to the US in terms of obesity rates. Uh, at the same time that the government is abolishing the Preventive Health Agency and um, making it harder to go to GP, these sorts of things. I'm interested in whether you see any future where the Senate might take more of a role in actually thinking about uh, and taking some role in, in assuring some accountability around outcomes and whether that would be a good thing, whether it's um, uh, ever likely to happen or what some other mechanisms for that could be. Yeah, absolutely, 100% the Senate should be uh, concentrating on whether outcomes are being achieved. And uh, that was, was really one of the goals of uh, uh, a lot of the public sector reform of the late 80s, even uh, through to the mid-90s, uh, to try and get a greater focus on outcomes, better performance reporting against outcomes, rather than just processes or, or activities that were being conducted. It's really important. For the, for the focus to be on, well, yes, fine, but does it make a difference? Does it make a difference to the lives of Australians? Uh, uh, and and that's that's vital. Um, now, as, as I indicated in the lecture, I think some of that focus did fall away um, uh, over the period. Oh, I don't know uh, what you'd call it, uh, but but uh, uh, much of the two thousands, um, and and it really it is quite important that the work of the Australian National Audit Office on trying to get better uh, accountability against outcomes and the work of Senate committees in trying to, to get that uh, does get supported because uh, that's uh, really the, the, the purpose of the, of the scrutiny is, is to ask, have you achieved any results? Uh, that's, that's the most important uh, thing to, to actually ask questions about. Well, on that note, I think we might uh, wrap up our proceedings for today. That's been a, a very interesting lecture, lots of stimulating discussion uh, to follow, and uh, it's it's a, a topic that is, is of vital importance to the health of our democracy, and I invite you to join me in thanking Stephen Bartos for a terrific lecture. <laughs>